There we go. Let's start it now. Okay, so on Tuesday we looked at the principles of how you make a spect image uh, in that you inject a substance that um, creates gamma rays coming from the patient. So the patient is glowing basically and you detect those uh, low energy gamma rays or 140 keV photons, high energy x-rays, low energy gamma rays, however you want to think about them. And today we'll look at some applications of that imaging technique towards these, basically these three problems, uh, coronary artery disease, acute coronary syndrome, or coronary heart disease. And acute coronary syndrome is when somebody shows up at the hospital with chest pain. And so you, they're basically having a heart attack. And that's obviously you have to treat that patient differently than somebody who is occasionally getting chest pain and uh, is that their cardiologist complaining about general malaise, right? So there's two different types of, of presentation. And just as a quick review, recall that the, the, print, the cause of acute coronary syndrome and coronary heart disease is the buildup of plaque inside the arteries which feed the, the muscle of the heart. And so there's the, we, I gave you that diagram of the uh, geometry of those arteries. There's the right coronary artery here, the left main coming off the aorta here, the circumflex goes around the back, and the left anterior descending goes down the anterior wall of the heart. Those three vessels are the major highways for the blood to get into the heart, and so if one of them of the three major vessels gets blocked, so you have a critical stenosis where the basically the plaque is, is only letting a tiny little blood through, you will get uh, an area of the heart wall that has a critical loss of oxygenated blood and the cells start to die. And that's called a myocardial infarction and that's a heart attack. It's a local thing. It happens in a local region of the heart. Uh, you can survive quite happily with a chunk of your heart that is dead, it fibrosis over, um, and, and you go on. The main complication is that if you have a patch of dead tissue or dying tissue in the case of you're having a heart attack and myocardial infarction is occurring in real time, you can generate very strange electrical patterns in terms of the depolarization of those myocytes, and that chaotic electrical pattern can be the thing that kills you because basically the heart no longer can depolarize in synchrony the muscle you get what's called ventricular fibrillation and the and you no longer your heart no longer contracts it just it, the muscle fibers are twitching all in a random order and at that point what happens is within a few seconds you pass out because your blood pressure drops critically the perfusion of your brain, you need it. If you miss a couple of beats, you start feeling lightheaded. If you miss about four beats, you just faint, right? So it's a, it's a real-time thing. You fall down, and if your heart doesn't recover from that electrical abnormality, you will you'll just die. You perish because of loss of perfusion of your whole body. If you're in an airport and there's a defibrillator on the wall, somebody can take down that defibrillator and you're your ventricle is, has this random depolarization going on, this random electrical signal. You take a large voltage and you go boom, and you put that voltage across the heart and it resets all those cells back to zero and you have a good chance that they'll all come back in synchrony. And that's what you see on TV when they defibrillate uh, a patient. When we, I think uh, Francisco might be doing MR Francisco Contijoc uh, and defibrillation inside an MR is a, is a very interesting thing, right? Because you have this huge magnetic field and you put paddles on and you cause a great voltage across someone inside a magnetic field. Not a good idea. <laughs> the paddles will just take off out of your hands. So you need to get the patient out of the MR before you do that. So the ischemic cascade, this is what's going on. Uh, both in your symptoms and 
what's going on in the cells, as the myocardial perfusion, if it's normal here and it's dropping because of the, this critical stenosis, you'll start seeing metabolic alterations in the, in the cells themselves. They'll start to try and uh, change their metabolism to keep up with the fact they're not getting oxygenated blood. The heart, the mechanics of the heart often changes in diastole first. That's the filling part of the heart cycle it will slow down, it'll, it'll kind of get viscous and slower. Then you'll see a drop in the actual contractility, the ability of the muscle to actually contract. If you're watching it on echo, you, you might see the muscle sort of slow down or parts of the muscle just stop contracting altogether. You will then see changes on an electrocardiogram uh, that are classic for ischemia and then pain angina, which is the classic pain that uh, a patient uh, reports when they show up and they're having ischemia in their heart. This is an interesting one because women and men present with different pain patterns. Women seem to be able to tolerate a higher level of pain, and so they don't report until they're at a more critical phase. Men, either the pain is greater or their tolerance is lower, they report pain earlier, it seems. So that's, that's been uh, measured a number of times, that there's differences in presentation between men and women. What We need to look at the EKG briefly. It's a kind of a form of imaging. It's like imaging the voltage pattern on the surface of the patient. Right? If you looked, if, you, if the patient was standing in front of you and you could make a color uh, mapping on the surface of the patient, and that mapping equals the voltage difference between some ground that you put on the patient and every other position, you would see an evolving pattern over time of, of this voltage on the surface of the patient. And that is a projection of the voltage which is in the myocardium, and it projects through the tissue out to the surface. So one, when it projects out to the surface, it's a very blurry picture of what's going on in the heart. Right? You would obviously like to have a huge number of electrodes strapped around the heart itself to see what the exact voltage pattern is on the surface of the heart, but what you've got is the surface of the patient, and that's this projection of those voltages through the tissues onto the surface. It's still a kind of imaging. Uh, the basic voltages that are measured and plotted out on an ECG are shown here. These are the bipolar limb leads. Lead 1, it's labeled lead 1 on the ECG, as we'll, we'll see. This is a classic ECG here, and the leads are labeled. There's 12 of them when you're looking at ischemia. Lead 1 is the voltage between the patient's right side and the left side, Okay, with this being called positive. Uh, lead 2 is the voltage between the patient's right side and their left leg. That's where the leads are, are placed. And... Uh, Lead three is the left side to the left leg. Okay, and so let's go to the, so here's lead one, lead two, and lead three. And we see the voltage, it's zero, there's no voltage, and then there's a little negative dip, then a high positive dip, then a negative, and then a, boop, a little positive thing here. This is called the QRS, and it's when the left ventricle and right ventricle depolarize uh, to create a heartbeat. And so that's the, the blip you see on the ECG. The polarity of this voltage uh, is shown here in a, in a normal heart. If these polarities start moving around, i.e. the voltage pattern starts rotating to a different orientation, that's an indication that there's something wrong in the heart, like there's a patch of muscle that's not depolarizing. And so... People get very good at reading these strips and deciding, yes, this is a heart attack, and I believe it's in the inferior wall of the heart based on the ECG. So for reporting an, act, an active heart attack, this is a very uh, sensitive uh, technique, right? To try and generate an abnormal EKG by through exercise, to determine that the, the patient has a critical stenosis is not a very sensitive technique.
people can get get through it. Then there's three other leads which are derived from these basic voltages. You take the center of a mass of, of these signals here and you measure a voltage from like the average of all these out to the right arm, out to the left leg, and out to the left arm. So these are the VR, VF, and AVL leads. And those are completely derived from these signals, right? These ones are. And then there are separate detectors on the chest wall that are placed across the chest wall. And uh, V1 through V6 are these detectors here, the little patches. And so you're basically mapping the voltage as you go around the chest from just on the right side of the sternum to just the left and then around the around to not all the way around the back, but just, just almost. And so those are V1 through V6, and they happen here, V1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. Okay. So, and here are the sort of normal projections, the direction of the projections of those signals. Uh, and you can imagine if you have a positive signal, right, in let's say this is V1 here, Let's look up here and say, well, where's one? It's this one. So that means I have a positive voltage from here out to here. Right? So there's a gradient across the chest this way that is positive, and it's a projection of the gradient that exists on the anterior wall of the heart. Right? So these things are everybody who comes in and, and has chest pain gets an ECG, essentially. And what they're looking for on that ECG as a critical sign that there is a patch of the heart that is ischemic and isn't depolarizing correctly, the, the fundamental sign that that's happening is this section right here. Under normal conditions, a classic ECG looks like this. You get a P wave when the atria depolarize, a QRS when the ventricle depolarizes, and a T wave when the ventricle repolarizes. In this interval between complete depolarization to repolarization of the ventricle, <clears throat> it's called the ST segment because this is the QRS and this is the T wave. This should be down at zero voltage. The, the heart should be quiescent. There shouldn't be a residual voltage across any of the walls of the heart during that time. It's all depolarized. We've contracted. Right, and the, those voltages now are equal. During the repolarization, there can be a difference from one side of the heart to the other, so you get a voltage. Somebody having a heart attack maintains a voltage across their heart during that ST duration, and so there's a patch, maybe that it's delayed in terms of its depolarization. Uh, it's at a weird position, and so this is called ST elevation, and it's the classic sign. If you've got ST elevation on your EKG when you come in and you've got chest pain, they will take you immediately to the cath lab. They will not, you know, basically pause and get a nuclear medicine scan or get some other diagnostic scan and just take you to the cath lab. And it's called a STEMI, right? It's an ST elevation myocardial infarction or STEMI. Okay. So here's somebody presents at the cath lab, they take the EKG. You can see these look kind of normal. However, we have this huge ST elevation right here, right, on V1, V2, V3, all of these across here, we have this big ST elevation. And so that's an indication that there is some kind of myocardial infarction in there. This person goes straight to the cath lab. And when they get to the cath lab, this is review uh, if this stenosis was critical and causing that STEMI, right, uh, you, you stick a catheter in there, you blow up a balloon with a stent around the balloon, and then you pull the balloon back and you're left with this stent keeping the vessel open. So you've now successfully reperfused that section of myocardium that was critically underperfused. And the question is, did you save the tissue? Right? So, you know, basically, time is tissue in this. If you get to the hospital really fast, 
and they open that vessel really quickly, then it can happen that you basically had this heart attack, you had these EKG abnormalities, everything goes back to normal, and your heart is, is okay. All the tissue is fine. The other scenario is you have lost some of that tissue distal or downstream from where this occurred and just the amount of lost tissue is proportional kind of to how long it took him to get get this vessel open right. so 2.3 million of these catheter based stent placements are done in the u.s every year so it is just normal practice now yeah That's, that's a really good question. It's like, say this is very firm, right? It's been there for a long time, has a lot of calcium in it and other things. If I blow this up, does it really look like this on the outside, such as it's completely flat, or does it bulge out? My answer is I believe it bulges out, right? So you're going to force tissue and force matter outwards, and so the, the whole radius is going to increase. That's not really observed on x-ray coronary angiography when you're doing the procedure. What is observed is when you inject dye post-procedure, you, you see the lumen again. You don't really see what's on the outside. So it's a very good point. Um, the, the other, so there's risk there that you, maybe you cause a tear in the vessel or you cause some damage to the vessel such that it re stenoses very quickly. Uh, the other risk is if this is really tight, trying to get this guide wire across sometimes is not that easy. Not only is it not easy, if it's really tight, the contrast gets this far and stops. So you don't really have a super confident idea of which way I should push the guide wire. And so that's called a basically a, a, a complete stenosis. And it, it's one of the hardest things to, to treat, especially if it's in a, in a strange area. So here's an example of somebody who, you know, presented probably with ST elevation. They have a critical stenosis on x-ray coronary angiography. And, you know, if you're looking, they have a stenosis here and also one down here. This is a regular, this is a regular up here. It's a messy vessel, right? There's a lot of disease in this vessel. But one would assume, looking at this picture, and this is, this is how this is done, is just like, that's probably the thing we should fix in order to restore blood flow. And so they go after this one, we'll say, and then it looks like this post-stent implantation. So it's much wider, right? And you can see that lumen itself is probably the widest of any of the remaining uh, lumen, so you can see this basically the shadow of the stent from about here to here along there. But it sure looks better, right? <laughs> it's hard not to want this done. I mean, if this is your corner and you got bad chest pain, well, I'll take this any day, right? I just, it just seems sensible. The Interesting thing about whether or not it's sensible is when you actually do clinical studies to determine does it lengthen, on average, a person's life expectancy if you change this picture to this picture. That's, that's a fundamental test. And then the COURAGE trial that's in your homework this week looks at that issue. How do we test that? Is this a good thing to do from the sense of does it increase people's life expectancy? So. So a perfusion deficit, as we saw in that, that first slide, if you believe it, can occur before the, you get that critical ECG change with the ST elevation. Once that ECG, ECG change has occurred, the horse is out of the barn. You don't really need any supporting imaging. You take the patient to the cath lab to treat them. Right? Prior to that, if they come and they have chest pain and they have classic sort of patterns of chest pain. Uh, the question is, and their ECG looks normal, the question is, do they have a perfusion deficit? Right? Is the blood flow eliminated? So this is CT images 
And remember, when we take a CT image, we inject contrast into their vein, and then we take the image sometime later, usually about 10 seconds later. And this part of the myocardium, remember this is the long axis view of the heart of the left ventricle, this is the right ventricle here, the chamber, and this is muscle. And this part of the muscle looks a lot darker, right? And so the presumed reason that that part of the muscle looks darker is that the contrast agent that causes a bright signal in CT did not get there. And the reason it did not get there is it had to get there through a coronary stenosis that was critical enough to stop flow from getting there. And so that's your inference is, oh, I've got this big chunk where I'm not, this is on the anterior wall of the heart where I'm not seeing contrast get in there, there's a perfusion deficit. Very rarely do you see it this clearly. This, this is just a slam dunk shot of a perfusion deficit. More than likely, this is a very big perfusion deficit. The, the vessel that's causing this is probably shut, you know, completely closed. A similar view with nuclear medicine that we looked at on Tuesday looks like this. You see these, they're kind of blurry, but the brightness corresponds to the agent getting into the tissue, right? In this case, it was a, a spec agent, probably uh, technetium 99. And in the short axis, you can see what should be a pretty symmetrical donut does no longer look like a symmetrical donut in the same way this does not. And so that's a perfusion deficit. And then on the anterior wall, there's the critical perfusion deficit. Okay, any questions about that? So, in this case, this probably occurs in a patient with a very critical stenosis. Okay, so it's, it's a high-grade stenosis. On the other hand, most people, when they present with an indication that they might be having problems with their coronary circulation, most of them present with discomfort, the fact that they can't cycle as far, the fact that they're 64, you know, there are all these other things that are causing them to worry about whether or not they have heart disease. And you need to stress them, as we talked about. And so these, again, I'm just showing these again. This is principally what's done in that group of patients that have moderate risk profile, right, to, to having actual positive coronary disease. A person who has an ST elevation on their EKG is no longer moderately at risk for heart disease. They have active heart disease. They're at super high risk. So you don't even bother to do diagnosis. You take them to the cath lab. These folks, on the other hand, you want to find out preemptively, can we find coronary disease in people that have, say, a 50-50 chance of having positive coronary disease, right? So by the time you're 65, and if you have high blood pressure, and you have diabetes, and you smoked for 24 years or something like that, your chance of having coronary disease is about 60%, right? So you're, you're in the high to moderate risk group. Right? So what you do with these folks is you do a stress test. And you take basically a nuclear medicine scan at rest, and you take it at stress. Oftentimes, the stress is done first, and then you let them recover, and you do a, a rest injection. Okay. You can see from these donuts up here, uh, it looks like this is after attenuation correction, which we discussed last week. We won't, we won't talk about that again. You can see after the correction that there is a chunk of tissue that looks like it's pretty low in, in terms of counts, and on the rest, it, it, it recovers right, to some degree. So it is stress-induced ischemia. And here on the 3D model of, of that myocardium, we see there's a, a patch here which is stress-induced ischemia. Okay. Uh, these are the short axis views. These are the long axis views. Same thing. And again, recall back when we looked at uh, echocardiography <clears throat> to report 
what's going on, you use uh, segments of the myocardium. And the traditional division, again, is six segments in the short axis views. One, two, the, the base, mid, and apex views. You have six in these and four in this one. And these are picked to be a size that correspond, you know, roughly to the size of a perfusion bed of a specific coronary artery. So fairly low resolution in terms of making a picture. This is obviously very low resolution, you know, with a chunk that, this big, that is this big. So nuclear medicine squeaks in and, and can do this kind of resolution. Like if you're missing this chunk up here because the LED is tight, you would expect that all of this stuff would be relatively diminished signal intensity. Whereas if these vessels, the RCA and the CERC are open, uh, you'd expect that to be bright. And so that, that's just keeping in mind the for our task that we're trying to achieve here, spatial resolution may not be the ultimate uh, imaging criteria that we want to maximize. Because basically we just need to find out if perfusion beds are being perfused. And wait, this is a review of what we saw last time. You can actually quantify with nuclear medicine the flow to a specific volume of tissue. And the units of that flow are milliliters of blood per minute per gram of tissue. Right? So if I have a, a box that's one centimeter on a side that's a gram of tissue, and I ask the question, how many mils of blood pass through that box in one minute? And that's myocardial blood flow. That's quantitative myocardial blood flow. One of the uh, papers, or a number of the papers actually, that you guys could go and do a deep dive in explains how you get this number. So you could explain it to the class. You could show us how the data is achieved and then how, what mathematical modeling is done in order to derive these, these numbers, this quantitative blood flow. And people like me, like medical imaging physicists, go nuts for this stuff. We say, oh, we, we really want quantitative myocardial blood flow because, because I think we can measure it, is, is the truth, right? That's, that's what actually happens. Whereas the, in reality, what you should ask is, do you, you know, how will it benefit a patient to get the actual number in mils per gram per minute, right? And uh, the, sometimes a lot, a lot of this stuff is done because you can do it. And I, I think a lot of perfusion imaging uh, can be done quite successfully just by looking at the pictures and saying, there is a deficit in this area. So, so <clears throat> stress testing is a huge part of cardiology, and that's, you know, probably all of you have seen depicted in a movie or, or know a relative or somebody who's done an EKG stress test where they strap EKG, EKG leads on you and they make you walk on a treadmill, right? And you walk on this treadmill, and then your heart rate goes up to a specific rate. And then if they can't get you going, they'll tilt the treadmill so that you're walking uphill for a while and get your heart rate even higher. And they look for EKG abnormalities. That's called a stress test. Okay? But there are many, many forms of stress tests performed in cardiology. Exercise is that one on the treadmill or a bicycle. Sometimes you, you have the patient sit on a bicycle and ride the bike. Sometimes they're recumbent in the scanner and you have pedals at their feet and they can pedal while they're lying down. Uh, those, those have been uh, designed. And then there's a set of drugs you can inject into the patient. Okay, here's four of them. There's more than four, but all of these drugs will change the function of the heart such that it puts a stress on the heart to try and uncover myocardial ischemia. And adenosine is an agent that increases the, or dilates the small vessels that control blood flow into regions of the heart. 
And so when you give a patient adenosine, their vessels dilate almost immediately. And it has a very short half-life, a very fast-acting drug, and, it, and it's gone pretty quickly. And so that, that's one way of, instead of making them exercise to increase their myocardial blood flow, give them adenosine. Regadenazone, same thing, right? You're trying to achieve the same thing. You want hyperemia, which means that you basically uh, increase the blood flow to the heart by opening up the vessels. Dipyridamol does the same thing. The difference between these drugs is this one is selective for the heart. This one goes all over your body, can give you, you know, headaches and, and things like that. It Dipyridamol also lasts a long time. So if you give somebody dipyridamol, they dilate. They're dilated for quite a while. And so you, you have to be ready to, uh, you know, if their blood pressure all of a sudden starts to drop and, and complications occur, you need to be able to treat them. Uh, and you can see that some of the other limitations and side effects of, of these drugs. Dibutamine is an interesting drug in that it's like adrenaline, in that it increases the uh, contractility of the muscle. Right? And so your heart starts beating more vigorously, and you're just lying there. Right, so it's, so it's it's a really interesting phenomenon when you when you have this drug. I've taken this drug once on a test, and and basically you're lying down there, and they inject the drug, and your heart starts pounding, just like you're falling in love or something, or you're really nervous or whatever, it just starts pounding, and um, and then you keep that drug infused into the person's blood at a certain rate, you drip it in at a certain rate to then move there heart rate up or their contractility up, right? This, is a, this can happen naturally, obviously. Like when you get scared, if for whatever reason you get frightened, your, your heart will start pounding harder, and it's, that's natural adrenaline. So it can happen naturally, but it's hard to control naturally. You don't want to scare patients into, into stress. So you inject this drug at specific rates to, to get it up. And then here are some, some of the protocols uh, for how you infuse those drugs and what the duration of stress usually is. Uh, this is the most interesting in that you ramp the, the dose or the rate of infusion up from 5 micrograms per kilogram up to 40. And you just keep ramping it up until you hit your target for how much stress uh, you're inducing. So we'll take a look at quick at a couple of examples here. Um, so here's somebody with high pretest likelihood of having cardiovascular disease because they have diabetes. They've got hyperlipidemia, which means they're either not taking their statin or they haven't been on a statin. So their LDL is high. Uh, they have hypertension. And so uh, <clears throat> atypical chest pain here. Uh, the stress electrocardiography, which is you put them on a treadmill and you wire them up for an EKG. The EKG didn't show any abnormalities in this person. Um, and subsequent coronary angiography showed 30% distal LAD. So that means there is a lesion in their LAD, but the diameter of the vessel only decreased by 30%. And a 50% mid-RCA stenosis. So neither of those lesions are super critical, right? in the sense that normally to get a perfusion deficit under stress, you need about a 70% stenosis, somewhere in there. However, it's variable from person to person because people have different collateral circulation to their heart. So for some people, a 65% a stenosis in a single vessel will be critical because that's the only vessel feeding a, a region of tissue. And in another person, they can have a 90% stenosis in that vessel because distal to that, the tissue is perfused in parallel by some other system, by some other vessels. And so it's, it's a poor indicator of whether or not you're going to have a perfusion deficit. It's just the geometry of the vessel. So here uh, you see that there's under stress and then they do, do the rest. There's very little perfusion deficit. So you would call this relatively normal, this uh, uh, spec scan, and uh, 
This is a functional part of the spec scan where you look at the signal at end diastole. If you continuously take data, but then you make images, say, in one phase of the heart cycle, say the basically the last 20% of the R to R interval, call that end diastole, and then you take images at 35% of the R to R interval, and they call that end systole, you get these two pictures, right? And they're, so it's dynamic. And so this is when the heart is contracted and all the muscles together, and this is when it's filled with blood and they're apart. And you can see that the signal intensity as a function of position goes up because all the heart muscle is coming together. This looks pretty normal. They've got normal function. I would not advocate using this data to measure cardiac function, but it's reasonable under these conditions, since you've got the data anyway, uh, to take a look at it. I think I might. And so here's the uh, normal perfusion uh, of this person's heart. So this is the raw data from which those images were obtained. And you can see kind of the fundamental signal to noise we're dealing with here. Uh, you see how there's a hash on top of the signal, and that's basically just photon counting uncertainty. You just don't have that many photons to make this picture with. And so if I have an activity at a certain rate in a, in a volume, and I acquire data for a minute, and I get a certain number of photons, there's uncertainty in just that number of photons just from the statistics of how the photons are generated. So you're going to get a higher and lower number in different trials uh, just based on the fact that you get a higher and lower number of photons you know, produced and detected. And so that's what causes this noise, right? It's not a really high signal to noise uh, signal. And so here when you play back, what if you parse up the data such that it's in different time frames during the R to R, you can see uh, an estimate of the myocardial function, right? Because you see that the muscle in a short axis view is, is contracting towards the center. And then this is a 3D mock-up of, of that signal, right? And so that looks normal. That's what a normal one looks like. And one of the the strength of this imaging technique of SPECT, I think, is if you come out with a normal scan, right, and, and you have uh, uh, basically other parameters that say that, you, you know, your disease is probable, if you come out with a normal scan, oftentimes you are normal. It's, it's pretty good. However, I've had three friends who had absolutely normal spec scans and they had pretty severe coronary disease. So my N, you know, of my friends is not good. <laughs> so the data, when you look at like a whole population of people, would indicate that this is a good test to limit to get, you know, a good negative predictive value, good positive predictive value. My data shows otherwise, but anyway, and we'll see in the paper I'll look at today that it doesn't seem to be that good. So here's a, an interesting case. So these, you're used to these now, this is the stress acquisition. And then you do a, you let them rest for a while, you do a new, ac new injection and you get rest. So, you know, it looks um, pretty normal here. There, there's a a bit of a lower signal here, but it's likely because we're all the way at the base of the heart. But at the mid level, it looks pretty normal and the rest looks normal. So it doesn't look like there's ischemia down here. When you look at the CTA, uh, this is uh, cardiac computed tomography with looking at the vessels. You come along this vessel and you see there's a nasty lesion right there, right? So this person has grown a lesion in what's in their right coronary artery, and there's another one down here, right? So you would, on CTA, call this person positive. They have coronary artery disease. However, for whatever reason, it is not producing a flow deficit on their stress spec scan. So the question, obviously, is 
given the fact that coronary CTA is, has higher sensitivity, we have an N of 1 here, where we've detected disease with coronary CTA and we have not detected it with SPECT, is the sensitivity of coronary CTA too high? Does this patient really have something to worry about? Before this came along, before this test came along, you would just leave this person alone because you couldn't detect it. Now you can detect it. What should you do? And so we're in that phase of medicine right now. It's like, now we can detect a lot more disease. What should we do? Should we treat all of these with stents? Probably not, right? So here's pure inducible ischemia, and on the long axis view, you can see under stress, whether this is adenosine or dipyridamol or regadenosone, you get this drop in perfusion on one side of the heart, and then it resolves at rest. So there is a, the, the amount of blood flow under stress did not make it to the, what is normal, which is the other side of the heart. At rest, it does seem to be a balanced, relatively balanced flow. This value of flow is going to be lower. Let's say this is one mil per minute per gram. You know, at rest, this might be five. And so this one only made it to two, or maybe one and a half. And so that, that shows the, the deficit. And so here's the stress bullseye. Remember the bullseye plot? This is the anterior wall lateral posterior wall septum and at the apex towards the septal side specifically you see this reduction in flow in the bullseye plot okay so that's a that's a pretty clearly positive test the nice thing about it is you have the rest to compare this with and so if, if there's some kind of image artifact causing a depression or a suppression of signal, it should show up here too. And it doesn't seem to. So, And this is, as bad as it gets, this is pure myocardial infarction, which means that the tissue is basically dead already and has been for some time. And it's probably a scar. So if your myocardium in a patch dies, what happens is that patch becomes scar tissue. And, and it basically holds the heart together perfectly fine, but it doesn't contract and it doesn't have electrical activation. It's just a scar. And it is not perfused very well. So under stress and rest, you see this big hole in this person's apex. So this is the long axis, a normal long axis view would look like this. It would be a horseshoe. And yep, we induced it in, in the stress test, but then when we let the patient recover from the stress and we image them at rest, it, lo and behold, it's still there. That deficit is still there. So this is called a fixed deficit, and it is indicative of a scar or an older infarct in this person's heart. And if somebody comes in and they're 68 or they're 73 or whatever, and you're imaging them and you see these, it's not that uncommon that they've had a heart attack before and they have these scars in their myocardium. Some people don't even know they had a heart attack. And you, and you bring them in, especially with MR, you'll see, you can image scar with MR beautifully, like with high resolution. And you'll see these scars in, in somebody's heart and they're like 53 and you say, did you have some chest pain a while ago? Yeah, sort of, but I just brushed it off. And they had a heart attack, right? They, they just sort of, powered through it. Right? So this is called a fixed deficit, which is indicative of SCAR. And so all of these uh, pictures, these examples, are coming out of this uh, European Society of Cardiology textbook. And the chapter from which these have been extracted is in the website for the course. Okay, So you can look at the text related to this figure if, if it's not clear what's going on. Okay, that's just that figure in blown up. Okay. So here, uh, those of you who are really good at 
looking at the raw data and making a 3D picture in your own head without doing the back projection and making the 3D picture uh, can see. So here's the heart. It's pretty obvious where the heart is, right? There's the right ventricle here and the left ventricle there. When it comes around, excuse me, let me get my arrow back. When it comes around to that orientation, right, that's the short axis view. Basically, we're looking straight down the heart, the barrel of the heart. And, um, and then we rotate here, we can see kind of a long axis view, right? So what's missing from this heart? So here I'm looking down the barrel, I rotate the patient, and we're here, let me pause this and get it. In that view, what do you think's missing at this point? There should be like a, a cap right here, right? So this is kind of been cut off. And so basically the apex of this heart has a fixed defect, right? So there's a, a defect here and then a, that defect is fixed over here. So that's what your raw data looks like. And um, so this person has an apical infarct uh, in the bullseye, you can see under the stress and the rest, there's this very large region that doesn't get any perfusion at all, according to the spec scan. And their function also, when you look at this model of how the heart is contracting, derived from these dynamic scans, even though we only have data in the areas that have tissue with the signal in them, right? We don't have any data at the apex because it's gone. When you look at how this is contracting, you can determine that it's not contracting terribly well. So the ejection fraction, the fraction of blood that's being pushed out in each beat is quite small. And so the heart is under some duress. And as, I, as stated on the slide here, dilated end diastolic volume. End diastole, as we, we learned right at the beginning of the course, is, is when the heart is most full of blood. And here it looks very big. Right? It's, it's become kind of a balloonish structure. And just like in that problem set where we looked at a healthy heart that had kind of a cylindrical shape versus the failing heart that ballooned out and was kind of spherical. Right? This often happens when the heart's not doing well. Uh, Okay, I'm going to leave it up to you to read this one. Okay, you can read the, uh, basically, the, the caption and understand what the story is behind this stress and rest pair uh, for this case. Okay. And then, again, there's the functional uh, estimate from the, from the movie. Okay, so when you're evaluating, what should I do? Like, which imaging uh, technique should I use to change the management of my patient? Uh, oftentimes you, you do a study in which you do thousands of patients and you, you put them in two pathways, two different pathways, and you see what the difference is in the outcomes, right? And those outcomes can be many things. They can be death from any cause, cardiac death, major adverse cardiac event or MACE, you know, down, downstream after you've uh, done your, basically your intervention. And um, evaluating it uh, is, uh, and deciding whether or not a, an imaging test is worth doing, like does it make sense to do it, is a, is a huge business. And uh, so, for instance, this is just an example from this paper here. You're welcome to look it up. I, I, I'll put it on the website. You know, of how does your post-test probability of having cardiovascular disease change? Like, how does your probability of having cardiovascular disease change from your pre-test likelihood to your post-test likelihood? Does the test do anything to that probability is, is the fundamental question, right? So if I come in and I'm, for whatever reason, I have diabetes, I've smoked, I'm 68, you put all of these factors together and you decide, you know what, 
Your pretest likelihood of having coronary artery disease is 75%. If we, if we look at all the people that have your characteristics, 75% of those people have coronary artery disease. And you ask the question, well, is it worth actually having a, a spec scan right, to determine whether or not I do have coronary artery disease? And if your pretest likelihood is 75 and you have a positive scan, a positive spec scan, so let's go from here's 80, here's 75 here. If you get a positive scan, you climb way up right, to almost certain that you have coronary artery disease. And these curves are derived statistically by looking at thousands of patients, right. There's a, there's a huge uh, science in how to do these studies correctly because uh, you can trick yourself by picking a very selected group of patients, right. So you really want blind, random uh, determination of, of who goes into the study and who goes into which arms of the study. Equally, you can see that if, I, if I'm this 75-year-old person with diabetes, etc., and I have a high probability of heart disease, I'm at 75% when I walk in the door, and my myocardial perfusion scan comes out negative, well then, my probability drops down to here, right? And so it, there's a huge dynamic range between a positive and negative test. And so that's why, you know, basically almost a billion dollars a year was spent on this test because of results like this that were published. And uh, because you can indicate which patients are more than likely should, should be treated or go to the cath lab. Um, they're, they, I'm going to only briefly talk about this, but the interesting thing about this is if you're mildly abnormal, moderately abnormal, or severely abnormal on a SPECT scan, uh, the probability that you will have a cardiac event, the rate of people in these boxes that have cardiac events, jumps up, obviously, you know, for those that have the uh, positive scan. And it's quite different for those who come out of that scan normal. So I, I would say this is the dividing line. It's interesting that there isn't much difference between these gradations of abnormality in terms of whether your probability of having an event, uh, you know, three to four is a bit. But there's a big gradation across this line. If you come out normal, you have a very low probability of having a cardiac event, right, than here. Um, and then, uh, similar with uh, SPECT, where you also take into account the ejection fraction, if you have a positive SPECT and your ejection fraction is low, that means that movie showed that the heart is contracting quite abnormally and that it's not ejecting much blood, then that really boosts up the probability you're going to have an event. And here's a table. Uh, of where, um, you know, myocardial perfusion scans, their sensitivity and specificity uh, compare with other techniques. And, you know, I, I would take all of these numbers with a grain of salt because all of these numbers are done in very specific situations where selecting the patients, probably the, the way the patients were selected, modified the, the result for the sensitivity and specificity. If you select really risky patients and you call many of them positive, you're going to be pretty right most of the time. And so you have to um, take all of these with a grain of salt because so much other information goes into making this call. And it's hard to do it. When you do it blind, as I showed you with the echo data where we had those four clinics reading stress echoes, blind, no information about the patient, you got remarkably different results right, from one clinic to another. So medicine isn't done blind. Medicine is done with an accumulation of data on a patient. And what you have to test is how does my imaging technique 
add to that data? Like, does it give me a boost in sensitivity over and above what I already have with that data? And then for physics people, that focuses your attention on what aspect of that imaging test should I improve? Like, in, in terms of these patients, you know, which, which is the aspect of the imaging that I should improve? Should I make it widely available and cheap? Should I make it specific for a very specialized group and not care about the expense, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. So here is a, a, you know, from the Siemens website of a system that can be just plugged into the wall, basically, in a doctor's office. And so cardiologists in private practice can just have a room in their in their office suite that just has one of these. And they can just do it to everybody. Right? So it's widely available. Right? And there is no negative feedback for sending a, a patient in there because it's not inconvenient for the patient. You don't have to get approval from some other place, blah, blah, blah. You just put them, you just do the test. And so this increased the amount of nuclear medicine that was done in the US through the early 2000s remarkably. Okay, so that's where we're going to stop on nuclear medicine. And now what I would like to do is give an example of a presentation of a paper, which is the summary of a paper and the main messages uh, of that paper. Uh, first of all, I'm going to...